Welcome to the fight with Teddy Atlas presented by Dynamic Striking. I'm Ken Rideout and it is my great privilege today to be joined by not only the legend Teddy Atlas, the voice of all combat sports, but legendary sports writer, New Jersey native, the legend Jerry Eisenberg, 91 years young. Jerry, welcome to the show and thanks for joining us. Well, it's good to be here. Jerry, it's great to have you. Um, we've been a friend. Of, we've been friends a long time, and I want to get right to it. Where you're one of only, just for the audience out there to make them more aware that might not know all of your accolades, and I can't say all of them because we would need about two weeks instead of a uh, short period of time that we have to put them all out there, but you're one of only two daily newspaper columnists to have covered the first 53 Super Bowls. You also covered 54 consecutive Kentucky Derbies, the last five Triple Crown winning horses, um, and it's rumored that you did the first interview with Adam and Eve in the garden. So between all of that and... You've been around some of the... Our audience is a fight audience. I mean, they're a sports audience, but combat fights, combat sports, whether it's UFC, MMA, boxing, and you've covered some of the greatest fighters of, of all time. I mean, I don't think anyone covered Muhammad Ali more than you did. And the reason we're having you on besides that you're so good looking and um, you're my friend, you put up with me so many years, is because we want to make sure we promote this book. I believe it's your 14th, it's your latest, it's a memoir, and as you can see it there, I'll read it, baseball, it's got a very interesting title. There's not too many titles that say baseball, Nazis, and Needix hot dogs. <laughs> Baseball Nazis and Needix hot dogs. Oh, that, that's it. That says it all. Growing up Jewish in the 1930s in Newark. I, I want to congratulate you on the book. I, want, I read it. I want to tell people that you should read it. If you, if you enjoy life stories, if you enjoy fun stories, if you enjoy history, if you enjoy serious stories, if you enjoy something that's an easy read and something that will make you smile and make you think a little bit about different times. You know, we all complain now these are tough times, and they are. They are for a lot of people uh, right now. But when you go back to the 30s, the Great Depression, and you're talking about you know, where people are jumping out windows because they've lost everything. And you're talking about those times. Those were pretty tough times too. And listen, I don't want to depress anybody because there's plenty. I, our, our show is about fighting and connecting the dots in fighting in life, about overcoming. And I think Jerry's book, is a great collection of stories from very colorful times, very historic times, tough times, good times, fun times, all kinds of times. And as far as the audience that we have, about some of the great fighters. And the one that I'm going to start Jerry with is for me was the greatest heavyweight of all time. I know a lot of people think that's Muhammad Ali. And that's if that's your choice... Beautiful. Uh, not a bad choice. <laughs> but to me, it was Joe Lewis. The, he's my favorite. And we talk about pressure. You hear it all the time. There's a lot of pressure on these athletes. There's a lot of pressure on these people. There's a, you know, there's, uh, can they handle all the pressure? We were talking about just recently, Teofimo Lopez against, uh, against Josh Taylor the other night. And we were talking about in our podcast earlier. Could Teofimo handle the pressures that he was dealing with at home, around him, all of that? Great pressure. But I would say that all of it, all of it shrinks compared to the pressures that Joe Lewis 
was facing. Let me just paint it, and then I'm going to give it to Jerry. Joe Lewis was fa- was the brown bomber. He was heavyweight champ of the world, and he only had one loss. It was a year earlier, maybe it was two years, where he had lost to Max Schmeling. He got knocked out to Max Schmeling. I believe it was the ninth round. It was in the late parts of the fight. He got knocked out. He went on to win the heavyweight title. When Joe Lewis won the title, everybody called him champ. He said, you can't call me champ yet. What do you mean? You just won the title. Not until I beat Schmeling. Now, Max Schmeling was a hell of a fighter and a hell of a puncher. And he was in Germany. And he didn't like it, but Hitler and the Nazi party made him a symbol of what they were calling what they were calling the supreme race, the superior race. And Hitler and his Nazi machine were going through Europe. And they were looking to basically conquer the world, take over the world. And with that, all of that happening in the backdrop, what does Joe Lewis have to do? You talk about pressure? You talk about pressure? Joe Lewis had to go into the ring with the only men who ever beat him in Yankee Stadium outdoors to fight him in a rematch for the world title with all of, with the world hanging in a balance, basically, where Schmeling is representing the Nazi race, representing Hitler, representing his war machine. Hitler's threatening the world, and Joe Lewis gets a phone call from the President of the United States before his fight saying, Joe, you got to win this one for the good guys. You got to win this one for us. You talk about pressure. You talk about pressure. That was pressure. And and I want to get the number here right. June 22nd of this month will be the 85th anniversary of Joe Lewis Max Schmeling 2. And Jerry Eisenberg, the great Jerry Eisenberg, he was seven years old listening on the radio with his father to that fight. 60 to 70 million people listened on the radio that night while over 100 million people listened around the world. I can't think of a better introduction, a better way to get the people ready to listen to this interview. Jerry, tell us about that night, about the great Joe Lewis and Max Schmeling and the world, the world as it was. Well, first of all, it was a misconception. Schmeling was fighting Lewis because he knew he had beaten him once and he wanted his title back. Lewis, there is, it is true that Roosevelt did call him, but Lewis was fighting not on behalf of all Americans. He was fighting on behalf of Joe Lewis. He wanted a piece of Max Schmeling worse than he ever wanted. But whether he wanted it or not, yeah. Jerry, the, the facts are that, oh, that yeah. this was yeah. in the balance. This was, this oh. was hanging over the fight. Joe Lewis was representing the free world. Is that fair? Oh, it's not only fair. It's on the money. But let me tell you, you have never heard the name Max Sperber, I don't believe. Max Sperber was a German Jew, uh, ran in asylum in this country. He was a newspaper guy. And he gets a job on a German language paper in New York called Stutz Zeppelin. And he goes up to speculate in New York where Schmeling is trained. Now, a speculator, I, I, I did once did a documentary on this beautiful lake in a lovely resort. Sperber goes up there representing his newspaper. But he's got to find a way to bring Hitler into this because he's got a personal alliance. He goes into the college where Schmeling and Max Mack and the trainer are living, starts opening drawers, doors. He opens a closet door and there hanging in the closet is, is a stormtrooper uniform owned by uh, the, the trader, Max Bacon. Well, he wings down. 
they're sparring outdoors. You can go watch them for a quarter, get through the gate. He's sparring, and Sperber grabs all the Americans. They rushes them up to the, to the cottage, opens the closet door. And in that moment, the fight became us against them because every writer in New York wrote about Hitler's emissary here. Now, he came with another guy. The guy's name was Arno Helmuth. He was sent by Joseph Gerben to broadcast the fight, show the superiority of the, of the um, super race over black fighters. And he, everybody Over hated everybody, him. not just black yeah. fighters, over no, but, everybody. No, this, was his, this was his job. Yeah. He comes in, he's alienated everybody. We used to go to fight camps three months before the fight. Alienates everybody in the camp. Everybody hates him. All right, now the fight, let me get ahead of myself a little bit. The fight starts, it doesn't go two minutes. Lewis is a devil, and I, I, I can't think of another fight where the other fighter was destroyed, a fighter with talent was destroyed by the other guy. And when this happens, they go back on the boat two days later, and Helmuth, all the writers get together, all the New York writers, they slip helmets and Mickey, and he he, he, <laughs> he vomits. He, de he de defecates. It, so that that was the fighter's revenge. But now for the fight, Lewis very seldom he chose his words whenever he was interviewed. And there was a story later which enhanced his popularity that he had said World War Two, we're going to win because God is on our side. That's not what he said. He said, we're going to win because we're on God's side. Big difference. So, Schrelling, uh, you know, the whole country was involved. And now, I personally was too much shy of eight, right? I lived in Newark, 10 blocks from the borderline with Irvington. Irvington was the state headquarters for the German American Bund. Wow. And passage across that line, you risk your life whichever way you were going. So I had a pretty good idea what was going on. And anti-Semitism was on a peak in this. It was unbelievable. So my father says, it, and I got to understand our supper table. That was my father's pulpit. You could talk about baseball because he'd been a minor leaguer. You could talk about the Nazis or the German-American boy because he hated them. If you want to talk about anything else, you had to get his permission to bring up a new subject. So I know I want to hear this fight, but they never let me stay up that late. And supper that night, he says, my points to my mother. He said, this is for you. He points to my sister, who's two years old with me. This is for you. And Jerry, this is particularly for you. While I'm going into the living room, we're going to listen to, there was no tell, listen to the radio. The radio was, at that point, was twice my height. We were all gathered around it. The fight starts. The bell rings for the fight. My father is on his feet. He's throwing punches. He's swearing. And my father's my role model. I'm on my feet. I'm throwing punches. I'm swearing. And my mother grabs me by the shoulder and he says, language, young man, language, language. <laughs> anyway, it, it, we know how the fight turned out. But now in 1961, I'm in an all black town, one of three in America, called Grambling, Louisiana. And at Grambling is the Grambling College, which is great for poop. So I've been down here to write a piece, and I'm walking down the street, and I pass something called the Campus Main Shop. So I'm interviewing everybody I go in. Calvin, Worker, uh, Calvin Wickersham is, in, is the guy that owns the, the main shop. And we're talking about Eddie, and he says, you know, Eddie wanted to be a fighter. And I said, yeah, Eddie Robinson. And I knew the story. His mother, just like Joe Lewis, said, you don't go on if you to win the next fight. Nobody told me about this. He loses the next fight. That was the end of Eddie Robinson's boxing career, but thankfully, just the beginning of a great football career. So then he says to me, I took you yesterday to Gallo's Barbershop, where everybody talks about the football game. And I watched Lewis and Schmeling in the back room at Gallo's barber shop. And the only difference was your father was home. We had a sweep in the barber shop because the clan was out riding with gun wraps and 
pickup trucks and stuff like that. So he says to me, you know, I never met your dad. Was your dad cursing when you were showing punches? I said, well, maybe no more than every two punches. And he said, well, I'll tell you, your dad's a white man. I'm a black man. We never met. But on that night, what was at stake? We were brothers under the skin. Wow. Which was a true. Wow. You know, I, again, all audiences boxing, they, they, they love sports, but I'm going to stay with the boxing. Uh, you covered more of Muhammad Ali's. I touched on it earlier. With, I was introducing you. But you covered more of Muhammad Ali's fights than anyone else, dating back to the 1960 Olympics where right. he won the gold medal. Right. Do me a favor. Do our audience a favor. Pick out one short story to share with us about the greatest, or as I said, who some think was the greatest heavyweight of all time, Muhammad Ali. Well, the thing about him was, for me, you got to remember, I wrote a column every day, and sometimes two. So I was very indebted uh, to Ali because Ali filled a lot of white space for me. Whenever there, I didn't have anything to write, i go to him, and there it was. He was, he was good at that. Uh, oh, here we I remember a time in, in Malaysia fighting uh, uh, the, the uh, Hungarian bugler, Joe Berger. And it wasn't a fight at all. It was a joke. So, Ali... Bugler always, was a British fighter. Wasn't he a British well, fighter? he was a Hungarian refugee who got British in China. Wow, 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 wow. And he crawled through the barbed wire to get out of Hungary and over to Italy, uh, to England where he could, where he was given the opportunity of fighting. Wow. He was good enough for when he had to be in England. So, yeah. now... Uh, or, they're trying to get a press conference that morning before the fight. So, Teddy, I hope I don't have to tell your audience. Fighters sign the inside of their gloves that they're going to wear that night. So they know they're getting the gloves that they chose. That's right. So the two fighters sign the gloves. And Bugner all but asked for his order. Yeah. Now, the little guy who is the mayor of Kuala Lumpur, the capital city, he can't get in the picture. He's about five feet tall, and all these people are mostly met. He's a politician. He's got to get in this picture. He runs up, grabs the microphone, he said, I want everybody in the world to know. The world will be watching this fight, and I want you to know this will be the only time we can vouch for the honesty of the gloves that are going to be used. He said, because tonight, the gloves, we're going to spend the night in a cell, a locked cell at the Kuala Lumpur Penitentiary. And Ali looks over. Ali, Ali, it's like a cue for him. He looks over and says, what are you saying? The gloves are going to jail? And <laughs> Muhammad Ali's gloves are going to jail? And they say, wait for the night. And he said, but those gloves ain't done nothing yet. <laughs> I filled up my whole column. I mean, you know. Well said. Well, <laughs> only the... the not only was he quick with his fizz, he was quick with his wit. And by the way, you guys were both right. Uh, Bugner was fighting out of the UK, but he was Hungarian by birth. Yeah. Yep. Not surprising. And it was, you know, how he was to me, he was my, I remember saying to my wife, I'm telling you know, you know, the guy. Eileen, the great Eileen. The, thank God for Eileen. Thank God for Eileen. Amen. Amen. Now, the thing about this was, he was fighting, uh, uh, he lost my train of thought, but anyway, I'm entitled in 92. So, uh, the amazing thing about Ali was, uh, he was a guy who, he cared about people, and found out about people. I had a divorce, and the kids were coming to live with me, I, I became a single father for many years. And, they were nervous. I don't know what the hell their mother told them about me, but you know how these thing, domestic things go. So now I went up to do a, a documentary on Ali. It was called The Last Fight. I thought the four minutes, they were the last two heavyweights in the world of my paid at that time, four minutes in Ali. So we're riding in a car up to Deer Lake, and I said to my son, who was interested in television, I said, 
you go with a television crew and carry a few things and keep your ears open. You might learn something. So my daughter at the time is 10, and she says, well, what am I going to do? And I said, You're, well, wait, go to Aunt Corinna's kitchen, tell her you're the official water girl of the Jerry Eisenberg crew, she'll, and she'll give you bottles of water, and if you smile and don't act like a child, she'll probably give you a piece of pie, which she did. Now she says to me, well, we're, we're just pulling up the driveway to hear it. She says, I hope George Foreman knocks them out. I said, what are you talking about? What? He said, well, you told me never to brag. And this man brings, I said, hey, you're, you're 10 years old. What the hell have you right got about to brag about? Yeah, what the hell have you got to brag about? Nothing. Keep your mouth shut. Get in there. Now we're packing up the equipment. And how he knew about my divorce, and he knew I had the kids now, and he knew I was a little nervous because they didn't know what to think of me. So, he sees Robert packing up, packing up equipment. He says, can I speak to that's your son? I said, yeah, let me speak to him. Well, I don't know what he's going to do. You never know what Ali can do. Walks over, puts his arm around him. He says, Robert, nah, do you mind if I call you Bob? Does he mind if he's called Bob, right? And he says, I'm telling you, you are now living with a great man. Great man. And if you pay attention and listen and follow what he does, you're going to be a great man too. Well, those are the words I needed to hear from Ali, you know, because at the same time, he says, where's your daughter? She's in the back of the room. We're talking very softly. So she thinks I'm ratting her out about what she said in the car, right? It blues it. <laughs> and she's pulling, trying to pull her molecules into the wall so he doesn't see her. He says, a little girl with a braid. Little girl, right there. You come up here right <laughs> now, right here. She loses the power. She has no control over the, over the use of English language anymore. She's going up there. Blah, 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 blah. He picks her up there. He sits where she's very small anyway. He's holding her over his head. And he says, that's your father? That's your daddy? Blah, 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 blah. Don't lie to me. Is that your daddy? Blah, 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 blah. Listen, he always, she's in the air still. He says, let me tell you something. That can't be your father. Can't be. Look at that man. Look how ugly he is. Look oh. how beautiful you are. Now give me a kiss. So she oh. kisses him. Now we're driving home. She says, oh, I hope he can win. I said, you're like all the others except for your age. <laughs> yeah, turned her around quick. That's a good one. Ali, Ali was special. He, he, was, he knew how to do that. Um, uh, you know, Jerry, again, sticking with the theme that this is a a, a great audience, but a fight audience is, you know. Um, who do you, with all your years, how many years you've been in the writing but 70? 72. 70, right? 72 years. With all the great fighters that you've been around and you've seen, and this is a tough question, but it's one that I'm sure that the audience would like to hear from you. Who do you consider the greatest fighter of all, I know you have a love for Ali, I get it. And maybe that's your answer, I don't know. But I never asked you that before. Who do you consider the greatest fighter of all time? The only Sugar Ray I acknowledge, Ray Robinson. Okay. He was unbelievable. Sometimes I think he was loaning the title to somebody. It's a, you know, it's hard to say, but he always, in the rematches, it was never close. And when it was close, and he had one round to either win the fight or whatever. He went out and he won the round and he stopped the guy. But it's hard. To, the errors are different. The fighters are different. It's like saying, who's the best football player? Well, football of the 1930s isn't football today. They're different sports. I mean, the rules are different. The bodies are different, whatever else. Allie, um, just to tell you, to me, Allie was not the greatest every way of all time. He was the heavyweight who made the biggest impact on the world. But as a fighter, I hate to tell you this, Teddy, you're right, Joe Lewis. You know how many people think Joe Lewis won a fight with a right hand knockout? When the race phoned the left hook to the solar plex, the guy was on his way out. All they saw, the crowd, or the film show, was the right hand because he always he followed with the other, other hand where the guy's going down. Maybe the greatest finisher, would you agree? Maybe the greatest finisher of all time, Joe Lewis. 
I could agree because guys who he he didn't respect his fighters, and who were, they were good fighters in those days. Anybody who fought was a good fighter. Yeah, but yeah. guys like Tammy Moriello, yep. Tony Galento, knocked him down. By surprise, he never could either one could knock him down first round. He got up. There was no fight once he once he knew he was down. He got up. That fight was over. It might take a minute. It might take the next round. That fight was over. He was a greatest finisher, and I really believe history robbed him. You can't judge him by the Marciano. I asked him one day. That wasn't Joe Lewis. That was an old, old, old. Well, that's what I'm Joe trying Lewis. to say. That's what I'm trying to say. I asked him one day. You know, I, I'm pretty close with him. I was one of 10 guys invited to his 50th birthday party. And I asked him one day, I said, how is it? Uh, what, what distinguishes between you being a great fighter you were and being an old man fighting a young fighter coming up? He said, let me tell you something. I saw every opening I had, and I got him in that fight. By the time my reflexes got together, I couldn't throw the punch the opening in the sky. He said, that was the difference between us and that. He's a great fighter, he said, but I couldn't perform. My reflexes were gone, and just, there was no way I could have beaten him. And he was honest about it. Yeah, well, he was always honest. He was a lot wittier and smarter than people gave him credit for because he was quiet and he was reserved. Ali, you knew he was smart because he made it very public, you know, knowledge to everybody by his wit and and he put it out and there yeah, and let everybody great, know. Ali also yeah. had a great boxing IQ. Yeah, he but, could adjust. But he's well, not Joe Lewis Lord. had a great trainer in Jackie Blackburn. Yeah, yeah. I thought uh, he was a great fighter, and I thought he did a great job developing Joe Lewis. Joe Lewis was one of the most balanced fighters I ever saw. Never out of position, always balanced, never never off balance. His feet were always where they should be, right under him. But the point I was making, Jerry, was that Lewis, because he was reserved, he was quiet, a lot of people didn't realize how witty, clever, smart he was he had some of the greatest one-liners and the i mean the the billy Conn fight where billy Conn was trying to become the first light heavyweight to win a heavyweight title and he was winning the fight in the third going into the 13th round uh Conn was ahead lewis needed a knockout take us from that take us take us from there well and the crowd was not pro lewis i mean Billy Kahn was a local guy in Pittsburgh. And he just, as Kai said later on, I got a little too, I got fresh with him. I shouldn't have done that. He went out here, he's going to knock him out. He's going to knock Lewis out. There's going to be even more decisive. But you don't knock Joe Lewis out. Not in those years. Not that. I want to tell you something else that you may not know. I was in Joe Lewis's home the day he died. I, I didn't know that, no. Well, I was supposed to interview him the night before. Burbick and Holmes are fighting in Vegas. And he's there with a cowboy hat. And he looks, it's, I'm looking at him, his face is emaciated. You know, it's, it's worse than people are admitting. And he said, he couldn't, he couldn't go through with the interview. So we had a guy named Freddie, who was his yeah, man body man. Nice. And Freddie said, look, I'll pick you up, we'll have breakfast, we'll drive out to you tomorrow. We're driving out there in the morning, and three EMS trucks run us off the road. When we get to the house, they're all parked in front. Martha opens the door and says, we lost Joe. That's what happened. And I said, do you mind if I go to the hospital with you? Because, you know, I want selfish, I do want to write about it. And I wrote about my memories and my father's memories and that night in the living room when we were throwing punches, everything else. Lewis is very important in our life because anybody who stood up to the Germans, and they took it for that, that's what the fight became. Uh, anyone who stood up to them was important to the Jews in 1930. Of course. And I, as I think I told you, we lived 10 blocks from the Irvington line. Yeah. One side of that line was the German-American but and the other side. I'm going to tell you something else about that plan. I'll bet you don't know. <clears throat> the emotions were boiling. Now, in those days, newspapers used to put out extras, like the morning paper would come out and arrive to the big story. 
That morning, morning of the fight, 22 Americans, German Americans, but they were Americans, were arrested that morning for spying for Nazi Germany. Wow. Now, it's a miracle that the fight between spectators wasn't bigger than the fight between the fighters because that was a patriotic thing. Yorkville district, strong German-American bone ties. Now, the Irvington and Bumming same ties. And every Jew who could buy a ticket, there weren't a lot of blacks there because they couldn't afford a ticket. And um, it was amazing. Uh, everybody was really involved in that fight. I mean, I'm telling you, my living room was part of that fight. Anywhere you looked, the German-American Bundholz were part of that fight. Now, you point out around the world, that's what it was. That, true. But we had an anti-Semitism problem when I was growing up. We had Father Coughlin, the radio priest of the year. We had a Gerald L. K. Smith, who, who ran a play called The Perfidious Jews in a Resort in the Ozarks. We had William Dudley Pelly. Hitler must really took all the colors, so he became the silver shirt. But it was the same thing. I remember the radio was always on in our kitchen. And Father Coughlin, my father didn't know who he was. My father's working six and a half days a week, just trying to make a living. And he hears his uh, radio priest in the air, and the guy said, it's Wall Street, Wall Street, Wall Street. My father says to my mother, you know, this guy's right, got it right. I'm going to send him $3 donation. Now it's the following Sunday, he's on the air. He says, he says, now I'm going to tell you about Wall Street. Wall Street is the Jews, the Jews, the Jews. My father's about to take a sip of his coffee. And he never lost his arm. Here's a pretty good ball player. He throws the coffee cup at the wall and shatters all over our kitchen. He turns to my mother and he says, that mummiser, which in Yiddish means bastard, that mummiser. I sent him $3 last week. And I never forget it. My mother looks at him and smiles and he says, you think maybe we could get a refund? <laughs> uh, she could laugh uh, through those days but my father uh, took that very seriously you know when I said Billy Kahn you went back of course to the Lewis and Schmeling fight but when I was saying the Kahn fight with Joe Lewis Kahn trying to become the first light heavyweight to win the title and he was winning on all the scorecards going into the 13th and Lewis needed a knockout and he got a knockout because Kahn engaged him too much but after the fight was over the press, boxing was the biggest sport in the country, bigger than oh, yeah. baseball at the time. Oh, yeah. And when it was over, all the press was there, and immediately they they went up to Billy Kahn, and they they asked him a question. They went to Joe Lewis. Billy Kahn said, uh, he took over the microphone, uh, he took over the press conference, and he said, Joe, I had plans. I figured that I would win the title. You let me win the title. And then we would fight a rematch and you win the title back and we could go back and forth and <laughs> and take turns and make a lot of money. And Joe Lewis, without a hesitation, the quiet Joe Lewis looks at him and says, how are you going to keep a title when you couldn't even keep it for three rounds? <laughs> Mr. 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 Khan? You know, in other words, Billy Khan was saying, I'll keep the title for three months, then, yeah, then I'll give it back it. to you. You'll keep it for three months. Then and he said, How are you going to keep a title three months? You couldn't keep it for three rounds. Well, he was and, on the money, and another, but the biggest fight from the American standpoint was now the international part was out of it. There were everybody was waiting for Khan and Lewis to get out of the army and have a rematch. And the way a friend of mine, I won't mention his name, he's a mafia guy. He had a big bet on it. And and <laughs> after the fight was over, he said, look at this. We gave the United States the flower of our light heavyweights. And they sent us back a fat alderman when it was over. Because he was out of shape. At, and that was the first $100 fight. Really? That was ringside top. Wow. They didn't, matter. They didn't know what to put it at. Mike Jacobs. He because was Ken was just talking about ticket prices during our podcast about, you know, ticket prices, oh, what what they are now. You, 
they couldn't build the ring. I, I, I'm giving you trivia, but it's it's interesting. You couldn't get wood to build the ring because it was all in the government had it tied up with housing projects. So oh. they took a, a load of wood over to a warehouse in New Jersey and played hoses on it for like three days. Well, they were, this is what do you want to build a house out of soggy stuff? We'll, we'll build a ring out of it. That's how we got the ring built. They they promoted a brick. They were ingenious promoters except for one thing. They never found the money level that they could have commanded. Wow. They were, well, if we make it to, if we make it 150, I, I don't know who's going you know, that kind of thing. But but as far as how you how do you promote, you know, everybody knew whoever had what the promotional right to the fighter who became Henry champion, owned all of Owned all the boxing that Carmi, Carmi, I think Frankie Carbo didn't know because they controlled the, the guard. And each guy during that period, there were three different uh, uh, guys that were president of garden boxing, and they controlled all the box. Jim Norris was one of them. Jim Norris was, I mean, Jim Norris had a partnership with Carbo. Frankie then, Carbo, Frankie Carbo, who they called Mr. Gray, the, mo- that's the, the mob guy. guy. That's yeah. the guy. Well, when I, in fact, I could tell you a story about him if you want to hear it. He Carver was a straight out killer, um, a, a killer, and he ran he ran boxing back in those days, and he basically told who was going to win, who was going to lose. Also, he was a great fight fan, so when he made fights, he couldn't lose because he had both fighters, and so he made some pretty good fights. Sounds familiar. Yeah, yeah, it sounds familiar, when, doesn't it, Jerry? It is familiar. <laughs> and here's a story about about Carmo. There was a guy named Big Greeny, a mobster, and he crossed the mafia. And he was living in a suite at the hotel in Elizabeth, New Jersey. And he get, Carmo gets him. Car, Carmo is a bun man. He was a killer. Yeah. He gets a phone call. Big Greeny is in the penthouse uh, at the Carteret Hotel. Go over there and kill him. And if anybody else is here, kill them too. We don't want any witnesses to this. So he goes and rings the bell, bring the answers, bang, 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 kills who's over there, runs across the street to the Elizabeth Police Department because the Elizabeth Police Department is on the pad with the mafia. He comes in, he tells the death sergeant, I did a bad thing. I shot Big Greeny. Well, it must have been self-defense, right? Well, yeah, I'd say yeah because he would have gotten a gun and killed me. So yeah, it was self-defense. Well, we'll put you in jail here for a week. We can straighten the beef. So while he's living in the Elizabeth jail, a friend of mine named William Gillisenberg, who was a promoter and was my entree into the mafia, he finds out that Babe Risco, world champion, is being managed by Carmel and hasn't for because he's in jail. So William goes, he has no promotion, he has no main event for December. He goes over to the jail and says, I want to see Frankie Carver. Don't worry about that name is here. Well, I mean, Mr. Gray. Well, I'll ask him if he wants to see it. Guy's in jail. I'll ask him if he has time for it. He goes to the back, gets, gets it, comes out, he says, all right. Frankie says he will give you five minutes, no more. He's very busy. Make your case. And he read him in. Well, of course, the jail cell is not locked. He, he said he was very busy. He's getting a manicure. Well, he's looking at the cleavage in the manicure. <laughs> at the same time, we had a five-star restaurant, hard to believe, in Newark, called the Tavern. Mom went up where he They're the old guys for the moves with the leather aprons, all male waiters. They're setting up his dinner in the cell, put a little candle up, that you get everything, a plow or everything. <laughs> While this is going on, like Carmen says, Carmen says, well, how are you? I never heard of you. What are you? Look, they're going to take away, you're going to take away my title? I'll cut your genitals off. He didn't say genitals. Then I shove them down your throat. Nobody's taking it away. I'm not trying to take it away. I'm trying to save. Okay. You can, you see, I got a guy who can't spell fight and let's let's do it. Back to fishing. It's in the record book. And he's going to fight your guy if you approve. He said, okay, you got to fight. He said, just like that? Well, you got to go down to Pine. You couldn't make this up. Pineapple Street in Brooklyn and he asked for this guy, I forget who it was, the big mobster, and tell him I said you got to fight. Goes down there, knocks on the door, 
the bouncer says, what are you doing here? They say, an Italian club. You don't belong to here. He said, Mr. Gray sent me to speak to whatever the guy's name was. He said, okay, but you better be telling the truth or you're not going or you're not walking out of here. He goes at it back. He says, now what is this about Mr. Gray? He said, well, he said I can do the fight. If he said you can do the fight, why are you coming to me? He told me you were the guy who would make sure all the rules were held. Oh, yeah. We got our own rules, you know. What's that? Your fight, when you get, oh, we, your fighter wins, we get him. We own him. But when do I get him back? <laughs> as sure as he loses. Him. That's a true story. Made that match in jail. But that was, you know, they were terrible days. But on the other hand, I love writing about it. Oh, yeah. I mean, you had plenty of material. Hey, Jerry, I know uh, I, I know the theme is boxing here, but I know you served in the Korean War. It looks like right around the time you turned 18. And I just love to know, like, can you tell us something about the Korean War? First of all, I think it's an incredible uh, gift to be able to talk to someone who's been around for 92, 93 years. It's unbelievable. I, I always say to my children when they question something, I tell them, I say, Imagine how much you're going to know in the next 50 years. That's how much experience I have on you. So when I tell you something, you should know that I speak from experience. So with that being said, tell me something. It doesn't have to be sports related, but just something that sticks out or a story from the Korean War. I think that these stories are invaluable and I think people will enjoy it. And I don't think a lot of people realize how incredibly intense those times were in history. It was a terrible time. And... <clears throat> I am one of the few people who do not have nice, warm thoughts about Douglas MacArthur. Because he led the American troops in. They were not equipped. I'm talking about when they, we had to get them over there to 75,000 Korean soldiers across the border. And these guys, were they were really a peacetime army. They weren't prepared for this. They were wearing Korean uniforms when they landed in Korea. And he was going to hate MacArthur wanted to be president. And why not? Because Eisenhower made it. And so we kept going. The UN, the UN said, you go to the 38th parallel, which separated the two countries, and you dig in there, and you liberate your career. Well, MacArthur went a little bit beyond that, and the feeling was, well, of course he goes beyond that, because he wants to make a little bumper between him and North Koreans. And he kept on going and going and going, because he wanted to be president. He got to the banks of the Yalu River, I believe it was the Chosen River, and uh, he was such a great military strategist. He didn't know that China was in the war until he surrounded Chosen, came from the other side, and riding these Mongolian ponies, and, and started what became the worst defeat with the greatest retreat trial when they had to get the lower troops out of there. Um, it's a war that probably never should have happened. I guess the the idea of war was worse, but it, it was bad. And we weren't winning the war. When they finally want to come to the peace day, they came because they knew they were going to get any further than they had been at that point. And they, today, this day, there is no end to that war. There never was and never will be a treaty. Between, between the, the Allies and, and North Korea and China. And I remember I went back to Korea for uh, the Olympics. And I was supposed to go in the opening ceremony. That was the fight where Roy Jones got robbed, right? Oh, that was, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, absolutely. In fact, they met Mercer coming into the ring. Jones got robbed, but they gave it to a Korean. The guy who ran the Korean delegation was giving out Rolex watches to the judges. <laughs> so, you know, it was I wish I was a judge over there. Wow. Uh, yeah, I wish you were too. But anyway, what happened was um, I saw Ray Mercer coming out, heavyweight. And Roy Thomas had been robbed. And yet they gave him the most valuable fighter trophy. So. Mercer came they would have been better off giving him a Rolex. Well, <laughs> well, I tell you this, <laughs> he would have uh, he would have appreciated that a lot more than I, the I trophy. Think, I think so too. But I'll tell you the thing: which Mercer's going into the ring, he's going to fight a Korean. You're talking about Ray Mercer now, right? Yes. 
who is yeah. also an army veteran. Well, he's going to fight a Korean heavyweight with a heavyweight title. And uh, I said to him, I gave him my arm, I said, better knock him out. There is no way you can win this title if you don't knock him out. First, you knock him out hard and quick and impressive. And uh, it, it was, a, it, you know, it just preached my contempt for the Olympics. You talk about the Olympic spirit. 1934, somebody crawls up the side of the Olympic headquarters, of the American headquarters, uh, in Lake Placid, saws the runners off the American bobsled. That's the Olympic spirit. I saw a guy die from an overdose of an overdose of uh, a drug called Ronicol and died on his bicycle in the Pelago, and nobody wanted to talk about it. Which is the first injection of steroids that we know about, right? Wow. And then uh, there's, but I'll tell you again, you got, you know, somewhere it's all the line, the decency of real athletes, no matter how good or how bad they are, is going to emerge. The Olympics in 84 in, in Los Angeles. There was this girl, her name was Greta Weitz. I think that's her name. She was a Norwegian, had a Norwegian mother, didn't qualify for the Olympic team, the first women's marathon. She said, well, my mother's Norwegian. I never represent. They said, you can run for Norway. I'm in the arena. It's the last day. The marathon you know, I, it, it's an unbelievable event. Now, you've got a picture of the scene. The whole floor of the arena, all different things are happening. High jumps, uh, javelin, uh, poor pointing dash, music, all of it. And suddenly there's this ghost. All of them, all, all around us except two have come in. There's this ghost standing in the entrance, so white he can hardly breathe. He takes four steps, people. Look, look at that lady over there. Was she, she's got her uniform like she's been in the Olympic marathon. And she falls. And everybody runs to pick her up. And she says, no, 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 no. You touch me, I'll be disqualified. She made that last lap inside the arena. She fell. She crawled. She hung on the, the ground to push herself up. And the more, the further she got, the more the crowd noticed what was happening. When she got to the finish line, she fell again and fell over the tape, and the whole damn stadium forgot every other event and came to its feet and cheered this woman. She never ran again. She never won anything, but she was a real athlete. You're, you're speaking music to the ears of Ken because his sport is marathon running, uh, Jerry. he He's a... He is the Masters World Champion for marathoners of the age of 50 and over. Really? Yep. Well, my hat goes up to him because uh, there is th th there's nothing that requires more guts in there. To finish it requires a tremendous amount of guts. To participate, you're going to get credit. And if you go halfway through, you get a lot of it. You should get a lot of credit. It's an anonymous sport except when you got the big meat, you know. Otherwise, you practice alone. It's the loneliness of the long distance run. I have a grandson who ran cross country the last two years. Never competed in any other sport. And didn't know what he was getting into. Never vomited. Never finished. He had a five-man team in his high school. Never finished fifth among his team. And I began to realize, when, and you know what? They, when they were in high school, there's no crowd. There's nobody, there's no cheering section. There's no cheerleaders. There's no band. All there is is a mother and an uncle and somebody else standing on the side <laughs> and trying to jump in the car and get ahead to the next stop when they can see their, their grandson again. Um, that is an unbelievable sport. And those who participate never get the credit. You know, I know you were very close to one of the greatest trainers of all time, Ray Arcel, and he was a trainer for Roberto Duran when he was when he was one of the best fighters in the world, lightweight champion of the world. And then he had that infamous moment 
the no mas moment in his rematch with Sugar Ray Leonard. And you're one of you're probably the only person that can tell this story. You were with because everybody's is still a mystique <laughs> about that fight. Why would the great Roberto Duran, the kid from Panama that was a street fighter in Panama as a kid who was a poor kid, finally got to the top. He beat Sugar Ray Leonard in a great fight. And then in the rematch, he says words that people never thought could possibly come out of Roberto Duran's mouth. No mas. And, and to this day, they still people still can't understand or phantom what happened in that fight. But you were with Ray Arcel, his trainer, at that fight and after that fight. Can you take us there? Well, I don't know what happened. I mean, I really don't. Ray never knew what happened. But I, I can tell you something that tells you a lot about Ray. After the fight, after Durant quit, and by the way, the worries don't last were relayed to the world by a referee named Miron, Mexican referee. I speak a little Spanish. I asked him what happened. And he told me, he said, no mas, no mas. And then I told everybody at ringside. And everybody was there when they said no mas. Thousands of people heard him say no mas. That's the way you start moments exaggerate. All right, now the cone rings in range were later. I never saw Ray. Ray lived to be 94. I never saw him in the in the Now, He's this is right out. after the fight, Jerry, just so right we understand. Right after the fight, right, right. And it's drizzling outside. And he gets, he says, I got to go back to the arena. I said, you don't need to go back there. Well, they want me there because you're going to hold a hearing about holding up his purse. And I said, where's his manager? He won't go. Where's your man? He won't go. So why do you have to go? Because he's my fighter. Until that plane leaves the ground and it's up in the air, he's my fighter. Even if I never work with him again. So we're, I'm going. I said, you're not going at all. There was a walkway, a very slippery walkway that connected the Hyatt Regency with the arena. Where they is. Super dope. And it's drizzling and it's slippery. And he's got a hold of my arm and we're walking down there to get to the hearing. And he tells the commission, you made money on this fight. This town benefited from this fight. This man has never had a moment like this, and I don't know what happened. I'm not going to But I'm telling you this. Do not do this to this man who met so much in so many cities when he fought and it cooled the economy. And so they re and during the media, they never met again. Now we're walking back up, and he's slipping in the rear. I'm afraid he's going to fall and die. And I said, Ray, Ray, you're just hiding out of my arm. Why did you go there? And he made a statement. He's my fighter. When I see that plane leave the ground in here, he's somebody else's problem. But as long as he's my fighter, I'm going to be there for him. We don't have enough managers or trainers. We never make a statement like that to you. And he's right. He was like a father. He was like a father to uh, Durant. Like a father that? to me. He was like a father to me. Well, I know that. He was just a wonderful man. And he just, and you know, Ray had a hit. Ray, had, Ray could look at the world and laugh. Yeah, that was an amazing gift. But he had some some real projects that he had to get ready for. Right? Ray's the only trainer I know, unless you did it, who said, I'm quitting right now. The fight's a week away. I don't want him to fight. He can't win this fight. He's not in shape. And I'm not going to be there in the ring when he goes in. That was Ray Michelle. Yeah. Yeah. You know, he, you know, we were talking about Frankie Carbo and the mob uh, earlier, right? And your familiarity with it. But uh, Ray Arcel, the mob tried to kill him. Tell us that story. I have a, I have a lot of familiarity with that story. I know you do. It was at the Manger Hotel which was next to the Boston Gardens. Ray never wanted to manage a fighter, but he wanted to be a promoter. And the fighters were all over Ray, so he could get the fighters. And the mafia didn't care for that too much. So he's coming out of the hotel, and the, the, you know, they'd congregate on the street, the, the, 
the trainers, you know, didn't talk about the fight. And it's a guy named Daly, Bill Daly. Yeah. He ran in uh, Martinez, who was a welterweight champion, a couple of other He was the point guy. He had the Boston Globe, which was a, which was a tabloid. You could fit it under your arm. He's standing on a tree. When Ray comes out of the hotel, he puts it under the other, which is the signal. The guy's got a pipe wrapped in newspaper, walks over and clocks himself twice in the skull. They rush him to the hospital. And another guy who I'm sure would not want me to tell that story, I won't mention who he was, he sat in Ray Arcel's room for two nights with a gun in his lap. Because they wow. were convinced they weren't finished with him yet. Oh, wow. And Ray, I'll tell you something else about you mentioned Duran. It's a great story. I can't help myself. Carlos Alina, Carlos Alina was the manager, right? Yep. He knew he was talking about Ray. Ray said, I will never go near another, another arena again. Never. So he's trying to get him interested because he had Duran. So he said, come to Panama with me, please. I got a fighter named Candy McFarland. He's fighting a guy named Lotri, an Italian from Argentina. He's a champion. Just tell my trainer. He said, I'm not going to do that. I'll take another trainer. It's fighter. He said, no, no, no. He was one of your fighters, Ray, and he asked if you could help. So Ray goes down there. Gets to an Army Navy store, gets a hat two sizes too big, a shirt two sizes too big, and he's got a driver who is named Chicklets. They go to the gym where Low T's training. And Ray's looking at him, he's making all these notes in his head. And a guy comes over and says, You American? He said, Yeah. Why are you here? On vacation, vacation. Nobody takes a vacation to Panama. You Ray Arcel. He said, Chicklets, we gotta get the hell out of him. So they do. He goes back and he says to Lunchy, now listen to me. This guy's got a habit. He will let you think you pinned him on the ropes. And he'll make a quick side step, spin around, and you'll be on the ropes, and he'll knock you out. He's got the punch you need. But if you're ready for that, it ain't going to happen. Well, I can't chase him. He's the champion. You don't have to chase him. You're in Panama. You stand in the middle of the ring, 37,000 Panamanians in the ballpark of speed. You point to a spot in front of you in the middle ring and go like that. Come here, come here, come here. And you say, well, don't worry. When when those Panamanians start to scream, he will come out. And that's how and he won a title. So Ray goes home, he's finished with boxing. Aletta comes to New York and calls him. I want to go for old time because Aletta used to set a bike. I want to go for old time sake. Let's go have dinner. Uh and then we'll, we'll watch the fights. And I bring Stevie, that's his wife. It was, he, he reluctantly agrees to go. He gets into radio. You might have known a guy. There was a guy named Bang Bang Quartus. He was a good, good club fighter. And that's all he was. He couldn't knock you out if you gave him an axe. And that's the kind of guy they wanted him to, because he'd look good against them. He's in the ring. He not, bang Bang Quartus does every trick he knows. But in a minute and a half, he's gone. The fight is over. Duran weeps over the ropes. Aletta is sitting with Arcel and Mrs. Arcel. He grabs Mrs. Arcel's hand and kisses it. Well, now he's got her for life. Got her for life. And he says, Ray, help me out. Will you please just, you don't have to train him. Just tell me what you see. Go off to Gleason's gym now. You know I'm talking about the one over the travel agency by the by the subway, the Bronx, not the one. Yeah, the original different. one. The, the original, original one. Gleason. Right, right. Bobby Gleason. That's it. So he goes up there, and he says to so he's got Louis Enrique, you remember him, I'm sure. He was the, uh, the interpreter. And he said, now I want you to tell him things exactly as I say to him. Don't clean anything up. Tell him I think he's got a great future. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Russo. Tell him also that he has no future unless he develops a left hand. He has no jam. It's just bang, bang, bang. And he's going to hit somebody who can bang a little quicker and a little harder. So you tell him he's got to learn. He gets so mad. He wants to walk out of the gym. He said, oh, I'm going to prove it to you. He said, Freddie Brown is in. Freddie is 
Freddie is like nine years younger than Ray. They're both older than than. The he, he was the co-trainer with Ray for the uh, Ray for all those years, and one of the greatest cut men of all time. Well, that he was, he was. Anyway, he says Freddie get in the ring. Freddie gets in the ring. He says Durant, go in the ring and hit him with your right hand, and nobody can see it. He throws a right hand. Brown duck slips underneath. Bang, 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 slaps Durant in the face three times. With Durant's ego, he walks out of the ring and he walks out of the building. Freddie says, well, what do we do now, Ray? He said, we come back tomorrow. If he's here, we got a fighter. And that's how he wound up training him. Wow. Well, that's a great story. Well, here it is, everybody. Once again, this is the book. I would suggest you go out and you get it. It's an easy read. It's a fun read. It's got the stories we just talked about and many, many, many more. Baseball, Nazis, Needix hot dogs. What more do you need to know? I mean, what a combination. Growing up Jewish in the 1930s in Newark, New Jersey, Jerry Eisenberg, the one and only. It's a great gift at any time. It's on sale now, most major bookstores, including Amazon, Amazon UK, and Barnes & Noble. Ken, do you have anything to add? No, I was just going to say a special thank you to the legend Fred Sternberg for arranging yes. everything and getting me a copy of the book here. I'm actually, Jerry, I'm going to uh, Mongolia in 48 hours to do a race across the Gobi Desert, and I plan on reading this on my way over on the uh, flight 15 hours connecting through Korea. So um, thank you for the book. Don't read thank it while you you're for your time. Running. <laughs> no, I wish I could. That won't be happening. I'm running 155 miles over six days. <laughs> but um, thank you for sharing all your stories and the wisdom. And uh, we look forward to having you uh, over on again when you turn 100 in a few years. Thank you, sir. I enjoyed it all for both of you. Jerry, glad we had you on to promote this great book. And thank you for your years of friendship, loyalty, and most of all, I speak for all the fans, I believe, for a lifetime dedicated to bringing stories of sports and the people who make these sports important to us all, and in some cases, even become heroes that wind up influencing our lives. Thank you very much, Jerry. Tell the missus I said thank you. No, I will. I definitely Please will. Please do. And um, you do the same, please. Thanks, guys. Thanks very much. Thanks, Jerry. Have a great week.